Well, good morning, and uh, welcome, welcome to Alive Wesleyan Church this morning. We're glad you're here. Um, we have a couple of announcements uh, before we begin our service. Uh, tonight at 5.30 p.m., we have a youth group, and then Tuesday at 10 a.m., we have Women Inspired by God. Uh, and Tuesday at 7 p.m., we have our LBA meeting. Uh, Wednesday at 8.30 a.m., we have the Woven Women are coming and they're praying in the sanctuary. Uh, at Wednesday at 10 a.m., uh, we have our Board of Ministry meeting. And then Wednesday at 6.30 p.m., we have our prayer and Bible study. Uh, Thursday and Friday, we have our district conference for the Penn York District. Uh, that will be attended by Pastor Josiah, uh, myself, Pastor Cameron, uh, and Vernon and Bev Robinson are also going to be our delegates for that. Uh, also, please uh, prayerfully consider continuing to be a Faith Promise partner um, or become a new one. Uh, the forms are at the Welcome Center and can be filled out and placed in the offering plate or in one of the boxes that we have. Uh, we also have a new web domain name that is alivewc.org. Uh, the old domain name will still take you to the same page, that is kirkvillewesleyan.org. Uh, um, but we are moving everything over to that new one. Uh, it is much easier to type into a computer. Uh, so you can go to our website a lot easier now, uh, but the old one will still take you there as well. Uh, don't forget to keep filling up the baby bottles. Uh, next week is the last week. Uh, next week is Father's Day, so don't forget. Um, that actually helped me not to forget. But, uh, don't forget to fill those up and bring those in so we can help out the New Hope Ministry. Um, where you can place them is in the overflow room with all the rest of the baby bottles that are starting to come in. Uh, it's just very exciting to see all the support we can have for uh, that ministry. And then also VBS is coming up uh, June 26th through the 29th. Uh, more volunteers are needed for that. Uh, so if you want to help volunteer, uh, come and see me. I'd be more than willing to plug you in somewhere and uh, we'll get this ministry uh, to the best that it can be. Uh, also, uh, start to start registering your kids, so that way we know how many kids are starting to come. Uh, we're super excited for that ministry to start. Um, office hours this week will be Monday through Wednesday from 8 to 12. Um, and then the church survey uh, that we started last week, uh, this is to help our LBA and our board of ministry to effectively evaluate what our congregation's perceived needs are and what our congregation can celebrate as a church body. So electronic forms uh, were emailed earlier this week, and so if you could please fill one out there, or there's also paper copies at the Welcome Center as well, so you can fill one of those out as well. Uh, so pl also please notice the insert about the needed items for the Sullivan Food Pantry um, and please continue to bring in items to support our community members in need. Uh, would you please stand with me as we uh, begin our time of worship together with prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day where we get to come together and worship you. Help us today to glorify you in everything that we do, in the songs that we sing, in the prayer that we do, and also in hearing your, the preaching of your word today. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for who you are and what you're going to do today, and we thank you. It's your name we pray. Amen. The children can be dismissed for Sunday school. to begin. Hello. 
love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. As was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life
great song. If you have, if you have praises, if you just want to thank the Lord for for what He's blessed you with. We've got our blessing jar up here because He is such a good, good God.
Uh, this time I'm going to have uh, the Board of Ministry and the local Board of Administration come up uh, that was newly elected at our uh, LCC back in May. Uh, this morning for our pastoral prayer time, we're going to have a time of prayer uh, for our leaders. And uh, I'm just going to have, yeah, if you're part of the Board of Ministry, your local Board of Ministry, would you just come up before the altar here uh, and just stand here? And our, our board of ministry is uh, fellowship is Sean Harrington. Uh, service to others is Shar Nemitz. Uh, prayer is Larry Nemitz. Missions is Bev Robinson. Worship is Claire Wilkinson. Discipleship is Pastor Cam Roberts. And uh, in the meantime, until we have an evangelism leading, I am serving in that, that capacity. Uh, our LBA is our lay leader vice chair is Pastor Larry Nemitz. Uh, our church secretary is Claire Wilkinson. Our treasurer is Eva Boswell. Our facilities director is Joe Doney. Our membership director is Aaron Wilkinson. And our members at large are Hannah McBratney and Sarah Eplin who are joining us. And I wanted to gather the leaders of the church before uh, the body and this table here uh, to consecrate them today as our leadership. Because recognizing that everyone stands here is a flawed individual, right? No one's perfect here? Okay, just making sure. You can raise your hand if you're perfect. Uh, but there are in, individuals in need of constantly growing in God's grace. And that's, as the body, I want you to pray for them uh, and ask that if you'd like to come gather around them and pray for them, uh, to lay hands on them, or uh, if you want to raise a hand out as, as I read this prayer and charge, you're more than welcome to, um, to do that. Um, but would you, either would you gather around them or raise your right hand uh, to pray over them um, as we read this charge here. Today is the senior pastor of Live Wesleyan Church who was called by God through this local church to lead all of you. I charge you as the leaders of the local board of administration and the board of ministry to stand firm, be immovable, and proclaim the gospel faithfully in word and deed, to live with integrity and pursue the gift of the Holy Spirit who will sanctify you through and through. Never neglecting the word of God as your foundation for truth, and always pursuing to lead out of the fruit of the Spirit. May you be filled with all love, all joy, all peace, all patience, all kindness, all goodness, all faithfulness, all gentleness, and all self-control. Would you represent this body of believers in a way that honors Christ above your own self to love others, even your enemies? Would you faithfully carry out the duties and responsibility of your leadership call as one who humbly points others towards Christ? recognizing it is God who calls you to this role as a member of a live Wesleyan church. Father, I lift up this amazing leadership team before you. Lord, you have called these men and women to serve you, to serve in a role that is leading this church. You lead them, and as you guide them, Lord, I pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit. Would you bless the board of ministry as they, day by day, every day are helping to lead different volunteers into serving this body of believers, into reaching out into our community, into ministering to the many who have needs. And would you bless them as they lead? I pray for the local board of administration as they govern this body, as they work to discern your will in all aspects, Lord. Would you continually bless them and guide them? Would you work in their hearts and minds? Would you lead them into all truth? And Lord, today I thank you for their leadership. I thank you for the way that you have called them to this, that you have guided them into these positions. And Lord, we don't take this call lightly. So Lord, would you bless them? Would you guide them today? And would you carry them on? And as they meet this week in the different meetings that they have, would you continually guide them by your Holy Spirit? Would their scriptures be their first foundation? Would their living hope be in you alone? Jesus Christ. You are our living hope. So God, we pray this today and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for praying for our board and our uh, local board of administration, our board of ministry. And uh, this morning I, I, I recognize on um, Many of us have different needs, so if there's any other needs this morning you'd like for us to lift up 
for you as the church body. Um, we'd be willing to hear those needs this morning and uh, be able to share in them with any prayers or praises that you would have. Yes, Stacy. First, I want to say I wish I could have hugged that whole group and touched every <laughs> one of them because that was just amazing. <clears throat> and second, what an amazing women's ministry we have. What a fabulous time it was yesterday. Right down to the games, we laughed so hard and we loved even harder. And the speakers were wonderful, the food was fabulous, and the fellowship was soul filling. So thank you for everyone who put their heart into that. Charlene. Praise the Lord. <laughs> uh, continue to pray for Kathy uh, Schofield. Uh, she's in rehab now. So we want to continue to pray for her uh, from the broken leg femur that she had. Then also it came to my attention this past week that Roger Tatura's niece, uh, Eleanor Conrad, passed away on Saturday, June 3rd. Eleanor Conrad's family be in prayer for them. Thanks. Definitely be lifting them up. Yes, I yeah. just continued prayer for the Jones as they travel up through Canada. They did make it across into Canada. They had um, some reservations uh, because Dick didn't get his um, passport before they left. So they apparently accepted his driver's license instead. <laughs> but coming back, I don't know if they'll have trouble getting back. <laughs> well, we pray and they'll have good travels. That's good. No, no smell. And maybe an old cliche, but God is good. How God prepares the way before you head there. A week before I had my seizure, um, my wife and I were working on our wills. That was kind of nice. <laughs> I guess I don't plan on taking it all with me now. <laughs> Um, the other thing is, I was working at getting in shape for my bike again, and I guess I'm going to have to use it for the next six months. Um, but overall, in all of this, I had a tremendous peace. Maybe my son and my wife didn't, but it was, it was good to know that there's a new reality facing me that I am finally getting old, and I've got to slow down. But, uh, one day at a time. Amen. Amen. God is good. Unspoken. Any other unspokens this morning? So the whole congregation? <laughs> I kid. But we do lift up your, your request that you are lifting to the Lord this morning. Any other prayers or praises this morning? Yes, Char. Um, two things. I just want to praise God for the good brunch we had yesterday. It truly was a blessed time. And what a family we have because people that came around, helped set up, brought food, and did the cleanup afterwards was just amazing. So I thank every, God for all of that and all of you who helped. Um, <laughs> Grace um, Sattler Hall actually made an appearance yesterday at the brunch. She was there to drop something off, but we sent her out with some food, so she's back home, but I'm sure she still needs our prayers. And also, I had a text from Carrie Sheedy, so I guess that's three things. Um, her dad, who we prayed for before, is still struggling with his oxygen levels. He's in Missouri, and she's anticipating a trip to visit him. And her mother-in-law, Diane Sheedy, who has attended here from time to time, fell last Thursday and broke her femur outside the Dollar General store in Chittenango, had surgery on Friday, so I'm not sure what else I had for Diane either. Thank you. I'll definitely be lifting up Carrie's family there. Thankful that Grace is home. Yes, Penelope. I'm pretty sure everybody can hear me without the mic, is that right? No. 
The people online, online like to hear your online. Your okay. Yeah. I was just really touched by the story of the four siblings in the jungles of Colombia that were found after being 40 days alone mm -hmm. after a plane crash. I don't know if a lot of you heard about that, but um, the 13-year-old uh, daughter, sister, took care of the nine and the three and the 12-month-old baby. And um, it's just reminds me that God is working in the darkest jungles. We don't know what's going on. All the news is not bad. God's forces are at work. His angels are at work. And I just praise him for these children. Suffer the children to come unto me. Praise the Lord. Helen. Good morning. I want to I want to ask you, lovely ladies and men, if you'd pray for Corey. I already asked for prayer for August, but his surgery has been moved up to July twelfth, and uh, he is home. And his little baby boy is with him, and he's getting acquainted with him, and he's beautiful. Thank you. Absolutely, we'd definitely be praying for Corey. That's yes, Eva. This morning I'm feeling a little overwhelmed, but I got to share a story yesterday. And it's a true story, a gentleman who had a son and he was waiting up for him one night and he came home and he was drunk. And he walked in the house and the father didn't say a word to him, but he looked at his son, then he looked to heaven. And he looked to his son and he looked to heaven and he said, God, it looks like you have a problem. And then he went to bed. That's how I'm feeling this morning. God. You have some problems, but I'm going to rest, and I'm going to be at peace and enjoy his presence, trusting that he knows better than I do. Yeah. Any other prayers or praises this morning? If not, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you uh, for this morning to have this time that we could come together here and, and see, Lord, the way that you have worked in our church. Lord, we praise you for how you've worked in the ladies' brunch this past weekend. We, we thank you for the way you've blessed them and the fellowship they had and the joy they could have with one another and centered around you, Lord. Lord, would you continually bless the ladies' ministry of our church. And Lord, <clears throat> we lift up those who are struggling right now. We think of Kathy and, uh, as she recovers in rehab from uh, this break in her body. And, and Lord, would you be present there with her? Would you continually strengthen her body? Would you strengthen her for every day that she has? And Lord, I lift up Roger Tatura's family and uh, the niece that they've lost of Eleanor. And Lord, we pray for your peace to fall on this family. Would you peace be present with Roger? <clears throat> and Lord, we lift up the Dones as they travel, as they go to Canada and travel all around. Lord, would you be with them? Lord, would you be keeping them safe? Would you work through all the details of this trip? And Lord, would you continually bless them as they travel? And Lord, this morning we're thankful as well for the way uh, you have protected Doug. Lord, we thank you for the peace that he has in resting in you, Lord, in the new reality he is. And Lord, would you bring him continual peace? I pray you'd give it to Erica and the whole family. Would you pour out your love and presence upon them? And Lord, we also thank you for the way that you've brought Grace back home from the hospital. We thank you for 
the way that you are present with her. Would you continually strengthen her and help her through each day? Would you be her portion and sustain her in all things? And Lord, we lift up Carrie and her family. Lord, as her dad is struggling with health issues, Lord, would you help in the midst there? Would your peace be with Carrie and would your healing power be with her dad? We also think of her mother-in-law who has fallen and broken her femur. Lord, we pray, would you be present with her mother-in-law and, and continually help to heal her body? Would you strengthen her and lead her? And Lord, we do think of Corey's upcoming surgery on July 12th. We, we, we pray, Lord, for the surgery that you would be with the doctor's hands. Lord, would you be present with them, working in and amidst the surgery? Lord, we know your presence is enough. So, Lord, would you go with them? Would you reveal yourself as the great healer there and strengthen Corey every day? And, Lord, I lift up all those who have unspoken requests this morning as they lay them at your feet. Lord, would we be able to rest and lay them there and trust that you will sustain us. You will care for us. Lord, we rest in your presence. As Eva, you shared, we want to rest in your presence. When the problems come, when any troubles come our way, we rest in your presence. We reflect on your goodness, your faithfulness, and your peace. Lord, we carry that with us today. And Lord, as we come into this time of studying your word, would you speak? And would you bless us as afterwards we gather in communion? Reminding ourselves of your body and your blood that was given for us. This new reality that we live in, Lord, is an amazing one. One that is blessed by you, your presence. So Lord Jesus, would you meet us here today? And would you take all our requests and would you carry them? And would our burdens be lifted and would we be released? And we ask this in Jesus' name. Well, this morning, if you'll open your Bibles, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at verses 16 through 23, and today we're looking again at, at, we're going through the whole book of Colossians here, looking at different verses within it, and this morning, Colossians 2, 16 through 23, talks about many ways that we're kind of recognizing that Christ has released us from our old realities and into a new eternal one. And that's, that's what we're really looking at this morning. So if you have your Bibles, we're looking at Colossians 2, 2 verses 16 through 23. Which says, Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack value in restraining sensual indulgence. Let's pray. Father, this morning, we ask, would you help us to see how we have been released from the former things, released from a way of trying to earn our salvation in many ways, of trying to make things look good on the outside, while the inside was destroyed by sin. 
Lord Jesus, would you meet us here today? Would your word become alive and active in our hearts? Lord, we desire to see you move. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this passage here in Colossians comes right after a passage on talking about Christ and the spiritual fullness that we have in Christ. And verse 13 speaks about how we were dead in sin and how we had died to sin and became alive in Christ when he forgave us of all our sin. And this reality now that we found ourselves in is found in Christ alone. It's not a shadow of the things that were before, what they thought was before. And there's this aspect of here that Paul is hitting on in these verses about those who are delighting in this kind of false humility. They're kind of puffed up. They kind of are trying to make themselves look bigger here by the pride of their own works. Or really, rather, what they're doing is they're denying Christ's full work. They want to make it part of what they're doing. And these individuals are, are disconnected from God. They're unspiritual is the word he uses, which is rather interesting. And rather than Christ leading them, they are leading themselves. And this is the key thing here. They're leading themselves. They're not being founded in how Christ is leading them. They want to appear in human means that they are saved. And verse 20 has this, this interesting statement, because I, I think we need to be careful as we interpret this this morning, because we could easily justify living our own way, in our own way that dishonors God, and we could say, now nah, I'm going to do my own thing. Now, I, I don't have to submit to anybody's rules anymore. You know, verse 20, where it speaks of since you die with Christ, the elemental f- spiritual forces of this world, why is though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? You know, these rules that we think about, there's this release from the human world's rules, but this is confusing for the Christian. Let's remember, God's word is always pointing us towards the principles of God's law. We're never released from his law, from his word. And that's where we are this morning. We're, we're starting off with this first point this morning of really what is customary and regulated among them was beginning to change. The rules were beginning to change for them. You know, no longer could these first century Christians look at the world as it was before them. It was different. It was new. And there used to be all these festivals and, and cultural aspects of the, the Jewish faith, uh, faith that didn't translate over into this new reality that they were now in. This new reality that Christ unleashed. No longer were they to be concerned about what they should eat or drink, but when eating and drinking is done for the Lord, it does no harm. That's really where they're looking at now. When they eat and drink, are they doing it for the Lord? But there's a big word in here that I, I think this freedom from human rules hits on is this word judgment that we could take a look at and others. And, and we could say, well, no one can judge me anymore. But let's remember this judgment was only in regard to really these human rules surrounding them, you know, surrounding uh, their ways. The way we honor Christ and how the reality we're in is no longer about judging how each other worships, but are we worshiping in a way that lines up with Christ? This reality. Clearly, uh, there are some judgments in in the town of Colossae. Clearly, in this church, uh, some some judgments are happening here that they're addressing. By some other Christians, we don't know, but it's clear. It has to do with this new moon festival, with the Sabbath, and Uh, other religious festivals. And this judgment regarding this, again, isn't saying no one can judge me now. It's about the freedom that we have in Christ from human perceptions of religious observance. In many ways, this is why we have many denominations that we have today. We have the freedom to understand Christ in a multitude of ways. But let's understand something. 
let's not take this as there is no judgment for those who defy Christ. Because we know that's not true either. We know that there is a judgment before the God of the universe. On top of this judgment aspect, there's this ritual aspect that they have here, this ritualism that's happening through these observances in a way that people are trying to honor God through these new moon festivals. In a way, this ritualism is trying to make the people appear more like they are honoring God. Maybe they're Jewish people trying to appear more like their Jewish heritage. And this self-imposed worship and humility, and often there was times where there was harsh treatment of the body, it kind of built up this importance of the flesh rather than putting it off. If our rituals and our worship are, are, to, are gratifying ourselves rather than God, then who are we truly worshiping? That's what we need to ask ourselves. See, God did not save us into a ritual. He saved us into a relationship. The human means we use to connect with God and to build a relationship with him matter. It matters. It does. But only as far as are we pursuing God, not pursuing the flesh. Let's consider for a second how this could apply today. Many today would say, I can worship God, call God, myself, his child, go through the Sunday rituals, take communion, uh, be baptized. Yet if they were to live against God in their behavior the rest of their time, the evidence speaks for itself. They were only gratifying the flesh, giving the appearance that they were observing God's rules. They've maybe taken up a religious observance. Yet there are those who follow Christ who wish to make others look like they are following Christ without ever having a relationship with him. And these people who do this often are legalists. And we've had a history of legalism in in churches around the world. But these legalists who would disqualify others based on their outward appearance or their actions, this this disqualification, it, it comes from... Uh, observance of these times of the Jewish customs in their, their time, and they would disqualify others, saying, you know, you're not fit in the mold here. You're not fit in this right way. Much of the Wesleyan church history actually had a lot of legalism in it, and we recognize that. They were trying to bring about righteousness, and I think that was a good goal, to bring about righteousness in people's life. And I think perhaps the people here in Colossians We're trying to bring about righteousness. I don't disagree with people who are trying to order people together to look like Christ. But if we are disqualifying other salvations based off of what clothes they were or the way they worship God, then we're missing something here. This disqualification of someone's relationship with God was putting ourselves in the judgment seat of God and saying, no, they're not worthy of God. I think I mentioned last summer, uh, last year during the summer, during a sermon, about things that were written in pencil, in pen, and in blood. This idea of that there's things that in the faith that are changing, the things written in pencil, but there's some things that can't be changed, the things that are written in blood. Again, the idea being here is that something written in pencil sometimes applies to a group of people. There's a group of people who decide this is what we should be centered around. But it doesn't apply to whether we would be saved or not. Not observing this new moon festival was not separating them from the living God. Therefore, let's make sure not to disqualify others based on their appearances, but more about the condition of their heart. It is not our place to disqualify the others, but to give life to others to the best of our ability. And this other aspect here, this unspiritual aspect, when it talks about those who are wanting to be free from human rules, these who are enslaving them to this rules, this unspiritual mind, seems to be those who are bound by these human rules. As Paul describes it, these people are puffed up with their own knowledge, their own self-righteousness, their own ideas that they cannot see the good work that God is doing in these individuals. This freedom from human rules is not a freedom 
to go into immorality. It's a new reality in which we recognize there is a spiritual realm where the things of this earth are not the primary things, but the secondary. Which leads to our second point this morning, that we're defined by divine rules. And these divine rules have this amazing truth to them in the scriptures. Throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see so much of God's truth unveiled through his teachings, through his words, through principles that we can learn through reading it. But we have to recognize there's something that defines our defined rules. There's something that defines it. And it's that there is absolute truth. Something that our world wants to deny, wants to talk away. It wants wants to make these things disappear. (laughs) Because if there is absolutes, then the reality is that they have perhaps created a reality that goes against God's divine law, his divine rules. When I talk about absolute and relative truth, let's talk for a second about what these words mean. The differences between these. Relative truth means what's true for you is true for you, and what's true for me is true for me. But the problem with this, the problem with this philosophy in life, with our modern times, is that if what's true for you is true for you, what if your truth is a lie? What if your truth is not the truth? In a way, this relative truth is a subjective truth. It's just based off of what we think is true. It's subjected through our own eyes, through our own mind, through us, through the self, through the flesh, as Paul would describe it. Now, in a way, the unspiritual mind subjects God's truth through their own lens of self. Now, people ask, how do you know if you're a Christian? How do you know if you're a Christian? I often would say, do you deny yourself and choose God? Do you deny yourself and choose him? You see, saying nice words doesn't make you a Christian. Denying yourself, being dead to sin, and choosing Christ above yourself makes you a Christian. When you believe, when you repent, when you turn to him, when you receive God's forgiveness, you become a new person. You enter that new reality and you see the absolute truth for what it is. It cannot be denied. In all the things of this earth, all of them, all the things of this earth become the shadow that Paul was talking about. This shadow that disappears. Because one of these divine rules is that there are destined eternal realities. There is a beginning and there is an end. And at the end, there is the reality that we will have to stand before God. We have to stand before him and account for our lives. Ecclesiastes 12, 14 says, For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Matthew 12, 36 says, But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. Acts 17.31 says, For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. This is speaking of Christ. This judgment is real. Revelation 20.11-15 says, Then I saw a great white throne, and he was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, the great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Not a pretty picture here that we have. There is destined eternal realities. See, there's a divine rule that defines the order of our reality and our eternal realities. And then, because of that, there are spiritual ramifications. There is judgment that comes for those who are not written in the Lamb's book of life. You know, you may not have to worry about human judgments anymore on what religious things you do, but there is a divine 
reality of judgment. Our lives are not without purpose, but they have a divine destiny. According to Scripture, after death, judgment awaits. The question is, are you ready for that? And are you living in the tension of that? Which leads us into our third point this morning that discusses how there's this aspect of living in between the freedom of human rules and being defined by divine rules. Our, our culture struggles with this, especially churches struggle with this, because so much of our own understanding comes from our own mind. Recently, I was, was listening to a theologian named uh, R.L. Solberg about some various topics on current issues that our society is facing and looking at it through a biblical lens. And, and what I found was, was a really helpful tool that I think uh, he brought into it to ex- examine how we look at Scripture and a lot of the issues we face nowadays. It's called principles and expressions. And it's how, uh, in, the, in, in the Scriptures, we see the principles of the law of God. In, in the Old Testament, when the law of Moses was given, the law was given to them. These were principles of God, His Word. And it expressed themselves through 613 Old Testament laws that helped to order the people of Israel around God's ultimate principles. Those of that we should not murder. Those of that we should not steal. So many principles here. I think as well we could look at the New Testament. We see principles in there. Like Ephesians 5.18 which says, Don't get drunk, but be filled with the Spirit. You know, these expressions of this and the holiness traditions would look at this and say, we can't let anyone be a member of our church if they drank any alcohol. And we've changed some of that. But at the same time, we have to understand the biblical principle here is guiding how do we look at what we eat and what we drink and the ways that we order our lives. And are we expressing this in the right way? You see, when we discern God's biblical eternal principle, it expresses itself in many forms. The expressions are not necessarily wrong or bad or overtly true for everyone, but they are a shadow of the true reality in Christ Jesus. We are expectant that these principles will be ultimately expressed in the ushering in of God's kingdom through Christ's return, through the way he will work in our life. Which leads us into our last point this morning that we are expectant of Christ's returning rule. It is Christ's reality that we are truly pursuing day after day after day. We are living in the shadow of the things to come. I don't think heaven is going to be exactly like a live Wesleyan church. I mean, I love this church, but I think there's some things that we, we're, we're not perfect in. We're living in the shadow of things to come. But there are expressions of God's divine and coming kingdom that we see in this church that are amazing every day in the body of Christ. We are a people who are dying to ourselves and recognizing the new reality that Christ offers us. You know, our death with Christ means a new life is coming. Both now and eternally, there is a life that we will find. One that we are looking forward to in eternity with God. And it causes us to live different today. It changes how we live today. I don't know if you ever took a philosophy class. If you haven't, don't worry. Uh, I'm just going to, you know, really open your brains to uh, morality, metaphysics, and whatever the other 3M was in my Houghton class. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Plato, one of the, the big philosophers in, in ancient Greek and, and all those times, or, uh, had this analogy that he used to explain things in a way that would help people understand them. And he called this the cave analogy. And he talks about a man who is sitting in a cave and he thinks what's real is what he sees as shadows on the wall in the cave. And then one day he leaves the cave and he sees the real things behind it. He sees that new reality. And when I heard the story, I thought of when my brother and I were kids and we played with flashlights with shadow puppets. You know, you think of, you ever had kids and you're camping with the shadow puppets and you're all making the different things? My brother and I, we'd sit in our, our bunk beds and we'd, 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 you know, make the bunny rabbits, all these different things. But they're, they're not the real things. They're a shadow of things to come. We're in an age of the shadow of the cross. 
But while we look at the shadow, and we can see it, and we're grasping at understanding this mystery, Christ is already standing at the finish line. He's already standing there with our victory. We can't see it fully yet. We don't need to stay focused on conforming to the way we understand the shadow. But focus on the one who takes us out of the cave and leads us into new life. Aim yourself toward the divine nail-pierced king who is living and coming again. You see, in in one of my commentaries, I love this quote, and it's kind of our takeaway today. Why play in the shadow world when you've experienced the real thing? Why play in the shadow when you've experienced the real thing? The thing is, we don't need to submit ourselves to all human expressions of rules of how the people understand these rules, but we need to submit ourselves to God's divine rule, his divine precepts. Don't let others tear down your faith when you don't express it the same way, but always, always, always make sure you are submitting your life to God's divine rule. His rules that govern our lives usher us into a new reality of freedom. We're released from sin, not to keep on sinning, but to live free, expectant of seeing Jesus. The shadow, it's going to disappear. Someday, the shadow of things that are now will disappear. And we're going to see the real thing, the real Jesus, and the real heaven. And the reality is going to be the best one. Let's pray. Father, as we come into a time of communion this morning, why this is Communion really is kind of a shadow of the things to come. It's a way that we remember, that we look at the cross and we say, Lord Jesus, we see you. We see you, we remember you, we honor you, and we want to partake of your body and your blood. Partake in the mystery of the way that you have redeemed us from sin. So Lord Jesus, today as we come before you, we see your new reality. We not see the shadow, but we see the new world that you have for us in Christ alone. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers. In the Wesleyan Church, we practice open communion, so if you want to participate with us, if you have a right relationship with God and with one another, we ask that you come and join us. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. 
would you take and would you remind of the new reality that you have, that your body was not broken, but his was for your sake, so that you could have new life. Would you take and eat this morning? Father, we thank you for your body which was broken for us. Lord, would you help us to see your body, to see the living body that we are waiting and expecting of returning as we wait for it. Would you help us to grow closer to you? We thank you for your body, which is broken for us. In Jesus' name. he took the cup and he gave thanks and he said this cup is the cup of the new covenant or represents my blood it's poured out for you see the blood is a reminder that it costs something his life for our life and we thank Jesus that he does give us new life through his blood would you take and would you drink this morning with Thanksgiving? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the blood of the new covenant. That as we were redeemed, we were released from our sin. From all the past things that were just a shadow of things to come. Lord, would you continually usher us into the new reality of seeing your kingdom unleashed in us, in a live Wesleyan church, in us as individuals every day. Would you help us to grow? We see you truly as the one that we are pursuing above all else. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand for the benediction this morning? Today, would you go and would you live released into the new reality that God has put you in? He frees you so that you can be a part of his kingdom. Would you go and live in it? God bless you. You are dismissed.